Hey folks, uh, I am here with Masi Graja uh, to introduce uh, a little overview of WTF is You Talk. Uh, hey Masi. Hello, excited to be here, excited for this course. Uh, I think it's going to be a great opportunity for people to get a version of You Talk that's more organized and catered to what they're looking for. There's so much on You Talk online, so I think this is going to be helpful. Lovely. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting uh, an opportunity to share with folks the core center grip, as it were. Uh, we prepped, prepped some slides. That is uh, one of the ways uh, that I think it's best to learn you talk. Um, but maybe we can just start, uh, you know, a lot of people have heard my story or why I think it's valuable. Um, but maybe you can just share a little bit about where you're coming from and what you think uh, is valuable about you talk and what you hope to share with folks in this course before we dive into some of the PowerPoint stuff. Yeah. I feel like there's so much there. I'm going to summarize it the best I can because <laughs> you talk has been so influential for me. Um, well, I got to know you talk more deeply in 2021. I think that's when uh, we met and started talking about it. Um, and the first few aspects of it that became very relevant for me were, were the clinical side of things. Cause I was in my training in psychotherapy at that time. And it's interesting because at that point I was studying psychology for like six years. And when I saw you talk um, and specifically the psychotherapy ideas, which people sometimes don't know that are there, but there's a heavy clinical practice, pragmatic aspect to you talk. Um, but that organized my thinking about psychology almost, you know, pretty much immediately when I got to know the system, you know, I devoured the book. And I was like, okay, this actually puts together all these different lines of thinking that I've been introduced to already, but that were pretty fragmented and out there and I couldn't really put them together, couldn't really direct my practice, my work, uh, my ideas about human psychology, the human condition in general, um, together coherently. And this is actually helping me do it. And hence why I have not abandoned it thus far and has really um, shifted my worldview in all this this grand way the, the cosmology of how to see humans in the world how to see nature as a continuous wave you know from matter to culture uh and beyond uh so in the this logos aspect of organizing knowledge and really constituting this breath frame for looking at the world and living life day to day that has you know been deeply influenced by you talk for me um and then there's the other aspect of things, which I also think is really relevant in general and for people who are going to, going to learn about this, is the mythos side of you talk. Mm -hmm. um, and that sometimes stands a little separated from the academic mm -hmm. argument, but it's really so nice when that's integrated. Because um, obviously Greg and I are partnered and this really opens up a lot of affordances in our daily lives, right? Because we get to live you talk uh how, how, how much we want uh, and of course not everybody's <laughs> going to do that but you know we get to fill our apartment with you talk pictures uh and we get to develop practices like the credo that we developed that maybe we can share in the course um the days of the week practice that we also have been doing um and that opens up this fruitful and pluralistic even though it's integrated and coherent aspect of the mythos of you talk and there there's so much ground for people to develop their own um activities and practices and ideas as has been done already by others right um so anyway i think that summarizes a little bit yeah, no, my, that's lovely. my passion and my investment yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah no that's lovely uh and i think that does a great job of sort of summarizing some of the key elements of the course yeah we will be introducing one of the nice things especially you do the campfire stuff um, Masi and I have been doing this, you know, living together uh, and on our journey and built a little you uh, talk monastery. Be happy to talk with you about a credo, the days of the week. Happy Culture Person Day, by the way. Uh, you know, Happy Culture Person on Day. On Saturday. Um, tomorrow's God Moon Day, and then the universe dies on Monday. Uh, you can learn all <laughs> about that uh, if you do the campfire sessions with us. Um, in terms of the basic structure of the course, I think you also really uh, highlighted a, a super key element, which is actually clinically, this is where it starts, starts in the psychotherapy room. People should know it has a lot to say about neurotic suffering, a lot to say about therapeutic practices, professional. In fact, I just spent a half day doing a we webinar yesterday on sort of the common core, a paper that you and I 
uh, co-authored together. It's under review. Uh, so it's got a lot of clinical relevance. And then I think we frame that in a way that can be extracted for everyday people to learn about their stressors, uh, well-being, things to cope. Um, they can get into big picture stuff. Uh, and then you use the word mythos, um, just so that people know what we mean by that. It's sort of the shared story that gives your life meaning in a collective. Uh, so it's like, what's the meaning making narrative? Um, what's the purpose driven orientation? This thing called the garden. We got an elephant sun god uh, that you learn a little bit about. Um, these are actually sort of icons and representations, uh, both of knowledge, but also of what we value and how. And then you'll be invited uh, to reflect on ways in which you would develop your own uh, symbols and icons and things like that, perhaps for what's sacred and meaningful for you. Um, so that gets us to uh, sets the stage then um, for I'm going to do a little PowerPoint, share a little bit about uh, the some of the elements in the course and just to give you this overview on what the heck is this thing. Uh, and hopefully by the end of the course, you start to grok you talk uh, a little bit. And uh, and I will, the last thing I'll say before I jump in is that it is the case, you talk is a very, very complicated network. I don't think there's any way around that. Um, and it really is like learning a language. Uh, so people are, hey, can I learn this thing? You know, I, we were talking about somebody who's like, hey, I want to learn this thing in the next couple of days. I'm like, well, I mean, good luck, right? <laughs> I got like three hours, I'm going to learn this thing. It's like, it's really like learning a language. Uh, and as Masia knows, I'm not great at learning languages. Uh, so it takes a long time. Um, but, you know, that's you learn your to, Portuguese. I, mean, I should you know, need to work on that. Uh, so let's dive in. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, kind of what you can expect if you sign up for the course. Oh, um, and OK. Um, so uh, we're, gonna, we're giving just an introduction of, to you talk. Um, and we can, you know, uh, go with, well, what is it? Well, the first thing to know, <laughs> the most basic uh, thing is that's the unified theory of knowledge. Um, and I'll just say very quickly, uh, what do we really mean by that? Um, the best way to actually, at least certainly in an academic sense, the best way to place that is to know about a book called Consilience, the Unity of Knowledge by Edward O. Wilson. Um, and he uh, is a big picture scientist thinker who said, hey, there could be a way in theory to organize our academic knowledge uh, from the natural sciences to the social sciences and the humanities and inform us uh, both the sciences and what they give us and the creative expression and value based seeking of the humanities in a consilient manner. Uh, that's a sort of sophisticated old world for unified, basically, um, and unified being conciliated. So it, it's, hey, it's a consilient framework uh, for thinking about knowledge. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, unified, uh, coherent, brings stuff together, ties, uh, removes foundational breaks uh, in our understanding. Um, in a more basic way, um, we can say it's a new system of understanding that effectively unifies the natural sciences the human psyche and the collective wisdom traditions into a coherent worldview. So, um, so if you're looking for something, hey, uh, is there such a coherent worldview? Uh, I would argue I haven't seen anything else. Uh, you can go, you know, look at uh, theories of everything and things like that. But I, I think you talk gives us uh, the, the channel with Kirch among all you look at other perspectives. I think you talk gives us the coolest, most broad and, and refined. Uh, coherent worldview is out there. And one thing that I think is really important about this is that, you know, we've been talking about practices and ways to apply it. And there is a lot of that, different ways of doing that online, right? I mean, especially in the liminal web, there's a lot of talk about practices and embodiment and all of that. You talk brings its own version of that, but within an endonatural scientific worldview. And I don't think that's, as far as I've seen, super common for a single system to bring both of those sides, the scientific and the humanistic, the wisdom orientation and the empirical grounding. Um, so you talk is very special because of that as well. And that's why I feel so comfortable uh, holding it as uh, so characteristic of my worldview. Lovely. I'm really glad you mentioned endo natural, because uh, that's actually a really important uh, framing. So endo in relationship to exo, we did a blog on this, if anybody's interested in it, we put it in the note, um, but basically within a naturalistic worldview. Uh, and the argument, and this will come out in our little, uh, as I move forward, uh, we move forward in this, uh, the argument is, is that actually our natural worldview got broken, and it's never been fixed. Um, and if you fix it, a whole bunch of things opened up, 
there's a lot outside of a potentially standard natural worldview, anywhere from aliens to parapsychology, telepathy, uh, to God, uh, to a big mind. Uh, those are all, you know, sort of outside of standard uh, worldview. You talk is open, uh, curious, agnostic, um, but really wants to keep bringing the focus back to, wow, <laughs> if we're here in this natural world, uh, we want his best understanding and the understanding we have is clearly broken and you talk uh, I think it not only fixes it, but uh, you know, gives a very, very rich and powerful advance uh, over where that is. So endo-natural, let's bring our attention to the here and now, reliable, valid, uh, clear aspects of our empirical world, and now let's organize them. So uh, to get to the center of Utah, I, I, I think, it's crucial to realize that the, one of the ways that Utah works um, is through its three philosophical pillars. Okay. Um, uh, so Utah's got three philosophical pillars. What I mean here in particular, philosophical, the closest meaning here would be epistemological pillar uh, in the sense that these things frame uh, different knowledge vectors. Okay, um, And when you see them, you'll be clear about why I, I would call them more epistemological, but they're, they're basically, hey, how do you know? And the first is the tree of knowledge system. Okay. And the tree of knowledge system gets this endo natural picture of the natural sciences. You've heard a lot of people uh, give big picture views. E.O. Wilson was one. Uh, Sean Carroll's got a big picture view. There's big history. These are all views uh, that share, zoom out and try to say, well, what's the worldview that comes from science? Uh, and uh, there's a general frame of time by complexity that many systems have. And Utah has that. And then <laughs> there's something Utah has. Uh, that no other system has, and that's these different dimensions of complexification that jump off the page here. Um, out of a gray matter, uh, colored gray matter, uh, jumps a, a dimension of life, out of a dimension of living organisms, out of that jumps a dimension of minded animals, one of Utah's most important uh, sort of contributions and critiques is that there's a whole layer of minded animal dimension. And then finally, cultured person, uh, us talking and justifying what we're doing, um, evolution of justification system ultimately give rise to science, uh, and then science builds systems of justification and institutions that produce knowledge that map, at least the natural sciences, this natural history. So, uh, the first pillar, this objective uh, view of science in relation. The second pillar is framed by this thing called the I-Quad coin, okay? which is a really unique element of Utah, um, but it basically says, well, science or the language of science, its justification, is a third person perspective. It takes us, sees what we see and then collapses what we see and then has procedures for regulating what can be seen through an objective perspective. The Iqua coins, the placeholder, I put a beautiful picture of Masi <laughs> there, um, because what it represents is the unique particular in the world experience of being, which is, you know, uh, if you know the history of science, they divided the qu primary qualities, which when they become quantities like mass, from secondary qualities, which are the experience of being. Utah figures out a way to bridge this in the tree coin relation. It is one of those ways, uh, one of the core ways uh, that it bridges that epistemological gap between third person and first person empirical frameworks. But it's not just a matter of seeing the world and then aligning that with science. Both of those are actually is questions, meaning what is the world from a subjective perspective? What is it from an objective perspective? Um, there's also ought questions and larger knowledge questions that bring us together collectively, that generate a transjective, to use a frame that uh, I've developed some with John Verveke across time, a knowledge system that brings us together, creates a collective mythos, to use Masia's term, uh, and the garden, which we will talk some about, is this holistic view okay, uh, of seeing what is and ought to be to, and how can we come together uh, and identify what's sacred, what's mattered, what's adaptive, what leads us towards well-being. Um, another comment here, um, specifically about these epistemological pillars or vectors, right, is how this is different from the quadrants that Wilbur did, oh, for example, lovely. right? And it totally relates to that. and. Yep. And you talk assimilates it, right, and integrates it in a way that um, it's very. Um, you talk adds the meat here, um, if that makes sense. Like it, it locates these vectors, and then it explains 
how, why they are the way they are. Like what makes up the subjective vector? What makes up the subjective vector? So you talk does that with its meta theoretical perspectives that we'll get to in the course, um, the whole architecture of the point and the ideas that make it up um, and all of the ideas in the garden as well. Um, so that's the frame, that's the vector and then um, the content that composes it. Yeah, you really uh, make a very important point there in relationship to that. Because uh, I know a number of people will be coming in thinking about Wilbur. In fact, we talked uh, some with Tom about Wil and and this relationship between uh, Integral and you talk uh, is one that I think is uh, worthy of a lot of conversation. If folks have desires for this, uh, you want to sign up for the campfire, um, we'll be happy to chat. We'll certainly reference Wilbur, uh, but I know there's a lot of interest and a lot of exploration. Uh, I'll say that I didn't know anything about Wilbur when our journey started. In fact, it was after I published my first uh, uh, paper in 2003 that people contacted me. I got interested in Wilbur. Um, I think Wilbur's got a brilliant epistemological perspective. Um, and so I really appreciate you bringing that up. And that's an important bridge for us to be thinking about. Um, so let me go. I'll go back to this. And just uh, to follow up on Masia's point here. Um, so the uh, right hand side is framed by the tree of knowledge and really the holistic tree of knowledge frames a system view uh, the lower right the collective systemic view uh, we can we will mention what's called the periodic table of behavior and that is actually the way you break up the schemas to get to the individual objective behavioral view uh, uh, to see the various layers and dimensions of objects in the world and then of course the upper left view um, is framed of the human phenomenological inside out interior individual view uh, and then what are we going to value as a collective culture what is our collective culture and even i would argue potentially metacultural wisdom meaning that we actually now in the digital identity error that we're going through you learn a little bit about a thing called a fifth joint point what is the collective we culture uh, and what kind of justification system uh, would be able to span the various nationalities and cultural identities and how do we do that while also retaining our, our community identity and our heritage and ancestry. Um, Utah has some things to say about that. So uh, if you're familiar with the quadrants, uh, you will be able to place the tree of knowledge on the right hand side, uh, upper left is I quad and lower left is garden. So lovely. Um, we can then uh, my friend John Verveke likes to problematize shit <laughs> and say, hey, when you come in, what's the problem? Okay. And you talk identifies four core problems. Uh, uh, and we've alluded to this already. Um, the first one's called the enlightenment gap. Um, and the enlightenment gap, actually, I'll give you in the second, the problem of psychology. I'll come back and the third is the problem of psychotherapy. And the fourth is the problem of the psyche. So the problem of the enlightenment gap. What's that? Well, the short answer here is, is that science, modern empirical natural science breaks off uh, and emerges as a knowledge system. Um, Galileo is a father of knowledge science. Um, it's different from the philosophical reflection uh, of both the Christian theological tradition, Aristotle's theological uh, and, and sort of divi divine science approach. Um, and it drives a particular way of knowing. Uh, there's an objective epistemology. Essentially, I just read a cool book called The Knowledge Machine that delineates this, uh, the evolution of empir exterior empirically grounded analysis of behavior, the collection of data, and tying theories to that. Okay? That knowledge system then becomes unbelievably important. It grabs matter and frames matter a particular way. However, the enlightenment gap is as it grabs matter, you cannot put mind, uh, whatever that concept means, in right relation. Um, and so what you get is a break, both ontologically, what's the matter-mind relation in terms of like, what are these things? How do they go together? And epistemologically, what's science and how does it connect to uh, subjective social not knowing? Uh, so the enlightenment gap is that collection of ontological epistemological problem. It breaks our core philosophical understanding. We no longer have philosophical coherence. Um, um, and I found out about that, um, I, I learned about that, the way I got into that is through the problem of psychology, um, and that is this thing that I stumbled into, uh, which is this thing, no one knows what the uh, <laughs> psychology is. We'll learn about why I say that and what that means, uh, but really the sciences start to become soft 
uh, we go from pretty hard sciences, physics, biology, and chemistry, and then we go soft. What does that mean? There's no conceptual, coherent, consensually agreed upon clarity about what the term is. Um, and uh, so that's super important. I try to emphasize that a lot. I think this is the intellectual's epicenter of you talk. Um, and to go back to Masi's point about some of its utility, it gets started in the problem in the world of psychotherapy. Um, I be, learned to become a psychological doctor. There's all these different elements. Uh, the, hey, do you learn cognitive therapy, behavior therapy, um, family system, psychodynamic? Um, how do you put all that stuff together? Um, and then I made the jump, well, it should be organized to the science of psychology. Then, oh my God, there's nothing there. Why not? Well, actually, it's the enlightenment gap. That's how these align. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is this whole, well, what is the psyche and how does that fit? Um, this is the tree coin relation. Um, so these four fundamental problems, basically, the core of the enlightenment gap, I discover through the problem of psychology and point to anybody. And the reason we can't solve that, <laughs> you can totally see the problem of psychotherapy. And it turns out you talk will help one of the real complexities. What's the relationship between science of psychology and psyche? So. Yeah, so all these problems are interrelated. It's really like a domino effect. Um, and in the courts, we'll talk about their interrelation, how, you know, the alignment gap directly affected the problem of psychology, then the applied side and psychotherapy, and really the psyche is lost in that entire confusion of epistemologies. Exactly. Um, yep. And so that brings us to, thank you, that brings us to the course. Um, so we've already talked about one of the topics that we'll talk about is to give you clarity of the three philosophical pillars. We actually do that in the second course. Um, we're going to introduce you to the tree of knowledge system in the first course, then the enlightenment gap in more depth. So if you want to learn about what that is, once you see uh, and really recognize that there's an enlightenment gap, you'll see it everywhere. Um, you know, I was just reading a book by Matt Segal on uh, Alfred North Whitehead and others, everything in there. Whitehead's challenge is basically his entire project is realizing I have to do something about the, there's an enlightenment gap. There's a matter mind problem fundamentally and how we know and how we frame um, over and over again. I was reading a Daniel Dennett book over and over again. You will see uh, that, you know, core problem, mind body problem in uh, philosophy, confusion in philosophy coming off of science, how to put a holistic scientific world to be together includes consciousness, et cetera, et cetera. This is the enlightenment gap. Um, and really, it's super valuable to be able to know that it can consolidate a lot of information. And believe me, if you solve it, <laughs> that's good too. Uh, the first major step in Utah's primary insight, uh, really, at the, at the level of what launches this. So the two core insights that launch the thing, justification idea, um, this tree of knowledge system. Uh, so you learn about that, and then you have a framework. And what and, and a real summary is, hey, how do we organize scientific knowledge relative to social and subjective? And how do we move from mind versus matter to energy, matter, life, mind, culture? That's what you'll be learning in the first course. That second course then says, well, once we have that, we can then share why is that one epistemological frame, science, and then how would we relate it to the other sides of the quadrant, to, you know, and Coin Garden does that. Uh, so in the second class, you'll get that. Then the cool thing is that problem of psychology that uh, you talk talks about uh, is a general framework for understanding human behavior. Um, and here's a little picture of the core representation of what's called justification systems theory. There's actually three theories that we'll just touch on, but we will then show you their application. Uh, that's justification systems theory, behavioral investment theory, and the influence matrix. We're going to take out the core concepts, justification, investment, and influence, and argue that these concepts give you dynamic functional concepts for framing human behavior. Okay. Uh, let's start with justification right now. What are we doing? <laughs> we are justifying why you should attend this course. And then we're <laughs> explaining and legitimizing all the components of you talking why it's a justified worldview relative to the worldviews you'll encounter and anybody else that's going to advertise. So you are a justifying ape according to you talk uh, and justification is the propositional network. Uh, and then we're going to be recognizing ourselves as both as animals, mammals and primates animals that are investors we our entire structure organizing make organismic structure behavioral structure is a work effort structure on investment uh trying to uh, afford uh action that gets return maintains control safety things along these line, uh, lines uh, relative to other costs and other kinds of things so we'll learn about the investment dynamics 
and influence, right? Influence, how, how are you connecting with people? How are you competing with people? What's the attachment system? How do you bounce off people and how do they bounce back off of you? This is all called Jai Dynamics. And Jai Dynamics and it's is based great. on Go ahead. based on the meta theories that you talk proposes. Uh, but what's really cool about the way that we're going to frame this in the course is that we're going to frame it as a tool, as something that you can use. You can use Jai Dynamics to analyze human behavior, your own and people around you. Um, and that's really cool. You'll get out of this course with at least two tools, one being Jai Dynamics, the other one being Common Mo. Uh, but, you know, we'll talk about the theory, but that's really not going to be the most relevant in this course. Really, what's going to be the pragmatic aspect of it is going to be the tool that you leave with to be able to use in your daily life. Exactly. So we will really hone in, especially on justification and influence and the dynamics of influence. Um, for example, uh, one of the things I talked about yesterday and we'll talk about here is the core relational value in social influence. Like, do you feel seen, known and valued and do you have good influence? You may not be fully conscious of this, but believe me, your primate system's track, tracking that. And so are other people's. And as you justify stuff, how it bounces off their sense of relational value or social influence is crucial. We will show you that tool. We'll give you some examples um, and we'll make that uh, useful for you as a way of thinking about and understanding human behavior. And Masia touched on the other thing. Remember, this is born in the clinic room um, and, and it was sort of a, in response to, well, how do we organize all these different elements? Um, and actually, I can't, we came back to that um, and developed uh, frameworks for understanding human suffering on the one hand. Okay, you'll learn about what happens to people and why do they get them with neurotic traps. A neurotic uh, response is something that actually is understandable but makes things worse. Okay, so neuroticism is when you're uh, responding to the environment uh, with distress and the way you respond to that environment <laughs> makes stuff worse. Okay, that's a mal when dynamics go wrong. Dijai dynamics gone wrong. Exactly. Um, and really, so negative events happen. Okay. And then you bring a negative justification, a defensive influence response, more hostile than you want to be. And then the other person hostily responds. And then that makes sense. We like to say you can bring water to a grease fire. Okay. I don't know. There's a fire. But if you don't really know, there are a lot of things like the way people avoid, how they blame, try to control. This spreads. Uh, trouble. Uh, we developed a way to see that trouble really usefully. So we'll tell her with you the looping process, okay, that drives people into trouble and how to have a, a mindset, uh, an inner mind's eye that can turn on and say, wait a minute, I can see that I'm now in a loop, okay? And the Calm MO flashlight is an integrated tool for psychological mindfulness that we developed um, that you can turn on the light, shine the light on the key elements that are making things worse. And first off, it's normally a negative reactivity. The opposite of that is calm. So you want to figure, okay, how do I turn my negative reactivity to calm? And then we'll share with you what the acronym means uh, and how to apply that acronym. And when you apply that acronym successfully, it's going to dissolve and reverse uh, those vicious cycles. So. And what's really cool about the structure of this course is that we get lots of interactive sessions and lots of time, it seems, to for people to ask questions and apply these concepts. So especially with Common Mo, I think that's going to be really valuable to be able to actually bring real life situations if you want um, and, you know, analyze this through dry dynamics, through the Common Mo framework. It's a really a great opportunity to apply this to your own life. Totally. So what the heck is this thing you talk? Well, actually, it's a new worldview, a new system of understanding. It's a deeply academic and rigorous system. Uh, it gives us a new picture to go from matter versus mind and the confusion and the enlightenment gap to an energy, matter, life, mind worldview. It actually carries with it a theory of human behavior, which is complicated, but can elucidate core dynamics, Jai dynamics, justification influence that we can give to you, share with you, um, tools for stopping problematic elements, and a framework that looks at the world through these different epistemological lenses and a frizzle gives you a way to cohere your objective worldview from science, your subjective experience of being, and orient toward a collective wisdom. So uh, we think that's worthwhile. <laughs> we think that's valuable. Uh, we <laughs> hope you agree. Uh, we love hanging out with people. And one of the most exciting things for me in this course is being with Masi about it. Um, and uh, this is my life for the last two years been completely transformed uh, with her uh, and living you talk together. And that's one of the things, great things about this course. We'll give you a behind the scenes peek uh, of our lives together and how it shapes our beliefs, our values, our everyday practices.
Yeah, I guess we, we have a real life example, right, in our system of how this really can um, change a lot in the way that you see the world and in your activities. So I'm super looking forward to sharing all this. Amen. Thanks so much to Parallax for setting it up. We hope to see you there. Very much appreciate it.